Welcome, welcome, your backup plan tribe. Whoop, whoop, here's another podcast, another live broadcast for my backup plan tribe today. Um, welcome, if you have never been to our page before, I welcome you to our site today. My name is Tina Ginn. I am an emergency preparedness coach, a best-selling author, a financial expert, and an app developer of your backup plan app. And I'm located here in Vancouver, BC on a beautiful overcast day. <laughs> I interview real life people with their real life stories each and every week. Uh, amazing stories, all very different. Um, I'm actually shocked with the amount of, of inspirational and motivational stories that each story brings to the podcast. Very, very amazing. Um, if you're new here, your backup plan app puts your life in one place in preparation of any unpredictable circumstance while taking the painful aftermath out of any tragedy. And that's what we're all about here. We're about trying to assist you in being prepared for the unexpected, because you don't know what tomorrow will bring. You don't know what tomorrow may change your life forever. And I have a special, special guest here today from Portland, Oregon, that I would like to introduce to everyone. Her name is Amanda Ferret, and I'm just going to bring her on. There she is. Hello. Welcome, Amanda. Welcome. How are you today? I'm good. How's everybody there in Portland, Oregon today? We're good. We're enjoying some sunshine, as you can see the brightness I've got going on over here. <laughs> we don't have it quite as sunny here. Um, maybe it's coming. I don't know. But uh, you can send it our way a little bit. I would love more. to. <laughs> Well, welcome, Amanda. Um, I wanted to introduce you, all our listeners on Your Backup Plan Tribe, to our show today with a certified emotional wellness counselor. She is also a speaker and an EFT practitioner. So maybe, Amanda, you could let us know, all our listeners, what does that mouthful actually mean? Well... After working in social services and mental health most of my life, um, I went to grad school for a bit, decided it wasn't me, which I'll share a little bit more about that in my story. And so as I was kind of figuring out how to come back into the working world, I decided to start out as a coach around um, emotional mastery. And then I found a wellness certification program with eCornell. So now I'm certified as a wellness counselor and I focus on emotional mastery and honoring our emotions, kind of making friends with our emotions. And then EFT is emotional freedom techniques tapping. And I'm certified in the McDonald manifestation method. And so tapping is a great tool for kind of working through our difficult emotions. Um, so yeah, I just I like, I like to hold space for people and those hard emotions and those difficult things that we all go through. I don't think we go through any of those emotions, Amanda. What are you talking about? Right? Why would we even need this app? Nobody goes through anything. <laughs> no. No, we're we're all Superman. And, you know, we're we're all Superman and and that's just the way it is. So, Amanda, the badass of holding compassionate space is what you're all about. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. So that is my innate magic name. It came about from a coach that I was working with in an activity that she had us do. And it's just because I am really able to hold those safe, sacred, compassionate spaces for people when they are in the darkest moments. Um, and I learned to do that because I had to learn to hold space for myself in my deepest and darkest moments. And Again, I have a background in mental health and social services. And so I not only have the education and professional experience, but I've got my lived personal experience of just having to deal with those really hard things and get through them and come out on the other side, stronger, more resilient, more ready to tackle whatever life may hand us. Are you any different for having all of that training and certification 
in actually dealing with your own emotional turmoil? Like, yes. you know, does it really matter when it hits your head? It, it's Yes, because before I used to, we have a choice to respond or react. And if we don't have tools, we react to things. But if we have tools, we can choose how we respond. So that's the benefit to having all the education and experience and training that I have is that I'm able to kind of stop and think and become aware of what emotion I'm feeling or aware of what I'm dealing with, right? Because awareness is the first step in kind of dealing with or deciding how to respond to any kind of situation. Mm -hmm. So once I'm aware, and since I've worked on and honed that muscle, then I can kind of say, okay, this is how I need to handle this. This is the, these are the tools that I have for this. This is what I know about this experience because I had something similar happen before, or this is new and different. So I'm going to be curious about it. And I'm going to try these things instead of panic and freak out. And mm -hmm. so while I'm not perfect, right, I'm still learning and growing. And I have my moments of, you know, panicking or not always being on top of it, I definitely have a lot more skills and a lot more ability to regulate and respond versus react. And I now am able to teach others how to do the same. And I think um, just from what you're saying, you know, your backup plan app, when you're prepared, when things aren't bad, you know, you do all of these preparation items, when things are good, when times are good. Um, and when times are bad, the reaction of all your emotions and stress and everything, it just impacts your whole being. And I just don't even know how to explain it. It's like your brain disappears. Well, <laughs> and it literally kind of does. You are literally shut off from parts of your brain because your amygdala is heightened, which is your fight, flight, freeze. And so when you're operating from your amygdala, that's kind of the primal brain, and you're not able to access your subconscious and your deeper thinking. So decision-making becomes harder. You lack those, you know, ability to kind of stop and think and assess. So that's part of what EFT does is tapping work actually helps calm the amygdala and the sympathetic nervous system and allows that parasympathetic nervous system to kind of come in the amygdala calms down so you can enter rest and repose and then you can do deeper thinking and make clearer decisions. Um, so, I mean, that's why I love it, but yes, mm. it's best to be prepared and get those things in line when you don't have to worry about your amygdala firing and your sympathetic nervous system being on high alert for sure. I find when that happens, people sometimes overreact in either, um, you know, emotional breakdown, kind of crying and not able to function that way, or they go the angry route and just want to put all their frustration out. And and that either one of those doesn't help the situation no. at all. So we want to try to avoid that and because it will, in, in a death crisis of a family member, it only creates more turmoil of all those people that are left behind holding the bag, so to speak. Um, but Amanda, tell us about your little story that you, I can hardly wait for you to tell me. <laughs> well, my story is full of a lot of loss and death and grief. Um, it started, I mean, started at seven years old, but it, where it really started to impact my life was in 2014. I lost my grandma, who was my person. She was my mom's mom. She got sick with lung cancer. And it took her very quickly. Um, I had last gone home in May and seen her and had a quick visit with her. And she'd asked me to move home from Portland. And I said, oh, grandma, I'm in grad school. I love it in Portland. I'm okay. I'm happy. And my mom called. It must have been just weeks later and said, grandma has lung cancer. We don't know how much longer she's got. And so I already had a vacation planned with my mom and we switched it where I was going to meet her in Spokane and then we were going to do a kind of a long drive home and I would get to see my grandma. We woke up on the morning of my birthday. We were, um, we're, we're up in the Flathead Valley area somewhere and I woke up to my mom crying and I realized, I found out that grandma was non-responsive and was failing very fast. So that was my birthday. We drove quickly to where my family lives in Tosta, Montana. And I spent the evening of my birthday holding my grandma's hand and she passed 
um, two days later. And then I lost my job. Then a good friend of mine died unexpectedly. And I was just kind of like, what in the heck? So eventually rebuilt my life, got into grad school, got another job, you know, started to do all the things. And then life was like, oh, you're doing good again. Well, watch this. <laughs> so my dad had been battling cancer for quite some time. But again, my birthday of 2016, it became evident that he was eventually going to lose his battle with cancer and lose it fairly soon. And so um, I made the plan to take that fall off of grad school and come home and help caretake for the last few weeks of his life. And I got about two and a half weeks of time with him. And then I stayed home for a while and then came back to Portland and went back to school that winter term and got probably four or five weeks into winter term and got the phone call that my grandpa was dying and it was time to come home and spend the last few days of my grandpa's life with him. So did that and was there as my grandpa passed and then did the business of death, right? The funeral, all those things. And then right back to grad school. Um, losses continued um, of kind of peripheral family and friends. And then um, the Saturday before grad school was supposed to start in the fall, I had down my cat that I'd had for 10 and a half years, who was my emotional support animal. She'd been with me from Philadelphia to Montana to here in Portland. Um, she got kidney failure and got sick very fast. Uh -huh. So put her to sleep, started grad school on Saturday and started grad school Monday. Um, November of 2017 comes and one of my dad's cousins passes away. There was some other loss and then my grandma falls and gets sick and it's evident that she's not going to make it. So I grab all my stuff with my, for my finals and I come home to Montana again and I complete my finals at her bedside and then stay for the funeral and the business of death and all those things and then come back in January, start winter term. And it didn't take long after that for my life to kind of implode. And I quit grad school and needed to take a break because I hadn't been taking care of myself. And the stress of dealing with the business of death. Now, thankfully, my grandparents had a will, but there were still a lot of things we had to figure out on our own. Um, it always is. Right. And my dad, my dad had my mom transcribe who got what on like a little <laughs> mini legal yellow pad. And like, he'd had conversations with us because he'd been sick long enough that like he knew he was dying. So we had those conversations. But since then, um, and this is why I'm so glad your app exists. Since then, we as a family have talked about things that I don't think a lot of families talk about. So I live here in Portland, Oregon. The rest of my family is in Montana. My mom's now in East Helena. My brother is out on the family ranch in Tostin. We've all had to have conversations like, what are your plans? Do you have the paperwork ready? Do we know who you want us to contact? And especially with my mom and I, with me being here in Portland, I live alone in my own home. I have pets. And my mom's like, I know I'm listed as an emergency contact in your phone. So that's great that they'll get a hold of me. But she goes, I don't know who to call next to come get Ludo and Esme or to take care of your house or that has a key to your house. Or she goes, so I need to know that stuff. And I pressured her to get all of her stuff in order because she, um, the winter, that winter after my dad passed, she wanted to go on a cruise. And it's like, if you're going to, if my one remaining parent, <laughs> you know, and my grandparents had passed at that time. It was the next winter after my dad had passed. I'm like, if you're going to hop on a cruise ship and go to Bali and be in the middle of this ocean, I need to know that you have everything in order because. Famous you know, last words. Right. Because not only when my grandparents passed, did we inherit their estates? My grandpa had stuff from his parents um, my grandma had stuff from an aunt and other, you know, so we have all these estates that we've been sorting through and trying to figure out, like, you know, we've got an organ. Like, what do we do with this, you know, organ? Who needs an, you know, nobody wants organs these days. And we have an old big cabinet um, stereo that's got an eight track player and a record player, you know, like we've got generations of stuff and it's like. And this do you messy. know, are there any accounts out there of all those people that have passed away? Do they know if there's any unclaimed money from accounts that might be sitting there that you don't know of? You know, that's the one thing my family was pretty good about. 
was money. So while we couldn't talk about other things, money accounting was one thing that my family was much better at than I am. I'm now, you know, I'm over 40. So now I've got my stuff together, but (laughs) you know, before this, and that's another thing, right. Is in these deaths, I did get an inheritance. So I had to get myself together and like, okay, this is, you know, never before had I had to list who's going to get my bank accounts if I die. Right. And now I've, I've had to grow up. I've had to really (laughs) become an adult and (laughs) learn how to, you know, Oh, I own a home. Who do I want to get my home if I die? Who, you know, who do I need, you know, who's going to come in and take care of my home if I'm sick for a while, which can happen, right? I have chronic illnesses and I'm disabled. So it's a very high likely that something could happen to me. Mm -hmm. And so my mom and I, before learning of your app, you know, we typed up a document of like, here's all my friends' phone numbers and here's who you contact for this and here's who has a key and here's who my dog trusts because my dog's kind of (laughs) picky, you know, and it's like... So I am so grateful that your app exists because people need to be ready for these things. We don't get out of this thing called life alive. Unfortunately, we all die. Mm-hmm. That is one thing we all have in common is we all die. And, and we have a few bumps in the road along the way. Right. And yeah, there's just, I mean, there's nothing guaranteed, right? So if you can make, like I talk about with death, I call it the business of death. And my family you know, my dad gave us pretty much everything. Um, We did have to pick out, I think the only things we had to make decisions on were um, what kind of box we wanted his ashes to go in. My grandparents, we had to, they had all the financial stuff and the will settled for like where their assets went, but we had to pick the caskets and figure out what we wanted for the services and, you know, like who do we all need to contact? And so, um, And then I just recently, I've lost friends. I'm now over 40. And unfortunately, I've been losing peers. And that's something I've watched happen in those instances is they weren't prepared, right? Because we're young. We don't think anything's going to happen. And then their families are left to figure things out. And like we had said before, when you're in grief or stress, making those decisions isn't always easy or you have to stuff away all the emotional stuff to have space to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. And that's not healthy either. Because as you can see in my case, I stuffed all the emotions away so that I could keep dealing with the business of death and then going back to grad school and keep doing all the other things that life, you know, was handing me and never created space for the emotional stuff and my life imploded. So when people use something like your app and have all their ish together in one spot, so to speak, then then how much like that just gives you so much freedom and like room to breathe if anything does ever happen and you don't know what's gonna happen right you know we we could just have an injury i say just but we could be in a coma or covid could be hit us and you know any one of us could be in the hospital for months right well your background is fire and here in oregon we had fires and Um, I was just outside the warning, like the get ready zone. Right. So that was something this last summer where I had to sit here as a homeowner and go, what do I grab? What do I even have to do as a homeowner? Like, do I have to turn off my gas? Do I know where my gas turn off is? Like, no, (laughs) what do I even do? Like, you know, so I was looking it up online and trying to figure out all these things. Right. And sitting here thinking, well, where are all my documents and what, what all do I need to grab? And do I even have all my, like, Oh my gosh, you know, and so I watched a lot of us here in Portland this summer that kind of live on this outer edge of Portland, where the fires were starting to get close, have to think about that kind of emergency preparedness. And then we got a snowstorm here just a couple weeks ago. And there were people that lost power two, three, four, five, six days. And that was another point where a lot of us were like, Oh, okay. Like, what do we do in these situations where we don't have electricity? We don't have all these things and we have to kind of figure out what our backup plan is. And so um, we definitely are feeling it more and more as climate shifts and things change. And, you know, we're kind of handed different things in life. It's like, Oh yeah, I probably should uh, get this all figured out and have this all 
and how handy dandy that you have one spot where we can put all those things that we need. That's right. And it, and it will let you know when you don't have it done either. So you can choose whether you want to postpone it or choose to do it that month um, because there's 12 sections of it. And it wasn't until I went through in the Okanagan, when you go uh, kind of north of Spokane, we were living and we were on five minute evacuation and you're running around. Um, no one can understand this until you actually live it. Um, but you know, you can smell fire everywhere. You have those little bits of the fire flying in the air. Mm -hmm. um, you um, I hear the bombers overhead. Um, it's such an impactful time. And all you're trying to do is run around the house thinking, where is my stuff? Uh, do I, where are my photos? You know, you're, you're not even thinking about the jacket that you want to take. You're thinking about where your stuff is. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, in the app, of course, there's an emergency kit preparation so you can put together your own kit. And I have updated that kit to um, PPEs. So for COVID time, um, what kind of things, additional things that we have to have in that emergency kit. And of course, you know, you and I both live on that West Coast. So earthquakes can happen. Yeah, I grew up anything. in Montana. So I grew up with earthquakes. Anything can happen. And so um, what things did you think that you found the hardest to deal with when you're having to do the business of death afterwards? Is it the emotional stress as well? Do you think? Yeah, it's that balancing of like honoring emotions and then clearing space to make decisions, right? Because you have to pick the caskets and the flowers. And then you mentioned something earlier too. You have to like, I'm not the only one there planning, right? I have other family members helping plan. And it, it particularly got interesting with my grandma Elaine, my mom's mom. She has four siblings. So there's five of them that have decisions. And my, you know, some of them have stronger personalities than others. Then there's 15 of us grandkids. So we all have our own opinions, right? And so that can, and then you've got heightened emotions. You've got stress. Sadness. Yeah. Sadness, grief, fatigue, typically, because people don't always sleep well with grief and loss and they've traveled typically to get there. And so that's just a recipe for disaster. <laughs> yeah. And we actually don't speak to certain family members anymore because it just kind of, you know, emotions got hot and heated and things blew up and, you know, you kind of got to see how everybody, you know, whether they had adequate coping skills or did not. And you know, it puts relationships to the test. And that's sad to me, right? Like you've already had a loss. You're there to celebrate the life of that person you've lost. How sad is it that then you lose other relationships because of the stress, because yeah. everybody's trying to figure things out. Whereas if it was all laid out and those decisions were already made, you would just have to do the work of honoring those decisions that were already made. But, you know, I find with people also, they will say, um, well, you know, we don't have much or my mom doesn't have much or let me tell you, it doesn't matter if it's money. I mean, people get together and it's, it's a recipe of disaster. It really is because they will fight over a teacup. Yes. Um, like there doesn't even have to be any value to it. Um, it's just, it, it's like divorce. Um, things come up that, you know, are not pretty sometimes. And you have to learn how to find a solution. And if it's all laid out, it's so much easier from the beginning because you don't have any regret or questions in your head. Well, is that what they wanted? Or do I pick that? Or what do you think? And right. So well, yeah. my dad was, my dad liked guitars, guns, and gems. So we each got our jewelry, you know, so we each got a guitar and we knew which one we were getting. We each got a gun. We knew which one we were getting and we each got the ju some jewelry and we knew what we were getting. Right. And he had that laid out, but like going back to my grandma, that there was 15 of us grandkids. 
thankfully us cousins were able to kind of, you know, those of us that were there went into the grandma's bedroom and kind of went through jewelry. And she wasn't a big jewelry person, um, but went through certain things. But my aunt who was having a hard time, um, she was the one, she was one of the ones staying in the house. The rest of us were either like I was with my parents and other people were in hotels. So she started cleaning out the house before the rest of us really had time. So we realized we kind of had to get in there and act quick if we wanted anything. And we literally planned a heist for me to get my grandma's sewing machine <laughs> before anything could happen because it was the machine I had learned to sew on. And so I really, you know, I really wanted the machine. And my <laughs> other aunts and cousins had said, yes, Amanda should have that. So, and my mom doesn't remember this, but it was great. We even got my dad in on it. So my parents lived just a quarter mile from my grandma. And so my mom and I came down in one car and made sure the coast was clear. And my aunt and her husband were off up in the, uh, up in the mountains looking for rocks and stuff. And so we call my dad and he comes down with the other car and we quick pack the sewing machine up and put it in my dad's car and he takes off and takes it back to the house. <laughs> so, you know and that's like these are the silly things that shouldn't have to happen I mean I love that I have a funny story to tell that like because my dad was just so cute right like I'll help you know I'll help with the heist and my mom doesn't remember any of it but it was so funny because how ridiculous that we have to plan a heist for a sewing for a, machine I know that's, that's how fun people can get and again you might not think you have anything but people's emotions and stuff just yeah, they can fight over a teacup or the smallest little thing and it's just not worth it. Um, yeah. yeah. It's like that. It, it sounds like you had the Ikea commercial. <laughs> you run and the sails on and they run in the car and say, run, run. Okay. Close the door. Let's go. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, you know, and there were some other things too that we had to kind of, because people have different opinions. Right. And so, you kind of have to figure out how to honor those opinions while also honoring the person that you lost and doing what needs to be done. And, and sometimes putting your own aside. Right. Which right. is probably the biggest dilemma is dealing with all of that. Yes. Especially when there's stronger personalities than others. And uh, yeah, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not fun. It's not fun. It's not, you know, fun. and the only reason I can laugh now is because it's been, you know, it's been what, seven years almost. So, you know, that time has passed and I've done my healing work. So now I can look back and giggle, but you know, there are moments where I feel bad for my mom who, you know, has a sister that she doesn't really talk to anymore, yeah. you know? And so it's unfortunate, but, um, you know, even if my grandma did have everything laid out, I don't know if that could have been avoided because again, personality types always play a role as well. But I thinking about your app and like, if I could go back in time and have the app then, right. Like, yeah, probably, you know, my brother sifting through files and making sure having everything in order. Right. And again, so you don't miss any bank accounts and you don't miss any, and, uh, yeah, it's just, and then with my dad, you know, he had had a pawn shop. So again, going back to the guns, right? Like we had guns that weren't his. So one of the things we did in his last couple of weeks of life was like going through and like, who do these need to go back to? Like, who do these, who did these originally belong to? Who were they pawned from? And like, what do we do with them now? And, but if something emergent had happened, we wouldn't have known. Yeah. You know, we were lucky to have that time to sort those things out. But that's not always going to be the case. Not in all instances, especially even if it's just an injury. It right. Could be, you know, a brain injury or something and or in a coma from COVID or something. And, you know, you still can't communicate with that person. Right. Yeah. I, I always say it's very difficult, too, for those families that have those strange hobbies because they're, you know, I had a client um, in our area that collects fire trucks. Mm. So um, I know that's a very odd, strange hobby, but at the same time, what does his partner do with all of the parts and actual fire trucks after he passes away? Like, how does your partner know who to contact? I mean, mm. there are some really good salespeople out there that could really 
um, limit the quality or quantity of your hobby, you know, from saying, oh, I'll give you 10 grand for it when it's worth 100,000. Right. So, so you want to try to avoid that and, and have in your backup plan uh, a place and a person to contact so that you can get that proper advice from because it's only the person that has the hobby that knows all the ins and outs of that right. item so yeah it, it it it's left so many spouses not knowing what the heck they have you know if it's spoons or artwork or jewelry or fire trucks or collectible right. cars or you know it's tough after what is the value of that stuff and and how do you sell it how do you get rid of it well that's so i love crystals in fact if i could show you my desk <laughs> like it's covered in crystals i'm wearing one of my you know like and so as i have built my collection up that was something i was thinking about is oh i now need to figure out what i'm gonna like who's gonna want my crystals when i go and who's gonna appreciate their value and their like because I'm just like my dad, I inherited rocks from my dad. My dad had some beautiful geodes and some other things. And he's got this one rock that we aren't sure what it is. We think it might be raw turquoise, but you know, I don't have kids. I have a nephew, but I don't know if he's going to want all my, you know, woo woo crystals. Right. So it's, <laughs> it is, it's, it's like, who's going to want my stuff and like, who's going to, yeah, know what to even do with it. Right. So you have to, you have those are things that we don't think about. We often yeah. take for granted. And the only reason I do think about them is again, I, I know what it's like to have to sort through my grandma. So grandparents were born in the depression. So had that depression mindset and they also lived out in the country. So going to the grocery store was like an hour drive. And so they had four or five freezers. They had all these pantry cupboards and so going to the grocery store was a big ordeal. And my grandma would cut coupons and all this, but she'd also, I think it was Albertsons that would have back in the day where you could earn like the plates and the dishes sets. Yeah. Yeah. And if there was a deal, my grandma Lucy was all over it. So we had, I don't even know, because again, I had to go back to grad school, but I don't <laughs> know how many dish sets my brother and my mom <laughs> packed up out of her one closet. She had all these dish sets from the grocery store. <laughs> And it's like, yeah, what do you do with that stuff besides take it to Goodwill or whatever else? Like, are you tossing something that possibly has value, you know? And so, yeah, something that you think could be mundane could be totally a money jackpot or yeah. just a, a pain in somebody's rear end to try to deal with. Yeah, so. or crystal or Pokemons or <laughs> Cabbage Patch dolls or... um. Just there's so many strange things that people collect that are like, what is their value? And where do you even look to get rid of this? Yeah. But the person collecting it always knows. So, you know, the likes of guns. I mean, what what do you do with that? Um, we were so thankful and so grateful to have my dad be able to go through and do that inventory with us and tell us the approximate value where, to, you know, and my brother kind of knows. So I was thankful my brother was there too, but if I would have had to do my mom and I forget it. Yeah. Yeah. She even still has some of his inventory, you know, cause he had a pawn shop. And so when he closed that, he still had some knives and some other things. And so it's like, yeah, well, my mom still to this day is trying to figure out what to do with yeah. tons of that stuff. I so. mean, that's, that, that's tough. And it's all those little things that seem to take forever to clean up. Yes. You know, you keep leaving it. Well, um, did you have anything else to mention to our beautiful listeners? Just, I, you know, again, I will reiterate that none of us get out of this thing called life alive and we never know what day is going to be our last. And while I hope all of us get to live lovely, exquisite, long lives, do the paperwork, get your stuff together including, you know, how do you want to be celebrated? What do you want your funeral to look like? And plan for funerals. Funerals are five figures. Mm -hmm. Like they are not cheap. And yeah, just be prepared, have a backup plan, um, know what you want and don't be afraid to talk about it. Don't be afraid to put it, you know, absolutely put it in writing. 
have that writing, you know, know, have your family know where that is. Um, and then go enjoy life. That's right. And enjoy life and know that you're looked after as well as, yes. you know, um, there's part of the membership program from your backup plan that has worksheets so you can have family conversations. And right. it's um, a worksheet and all you have to do is, you know, go down the questions and tick the boxes and, and it will all be done for you. Um, but if you don't know what to ask, if you don't know all the details of what a funeral home is going to ask you when you actually have to go in and ask a thousand questions, literally, there are a thousand questions that they ask about the person. Yeah. And you really have to wonder if you know all the answers. So, um, yeah, it's nice having that worksheet and being able to go down that with um, people that are still well. Yes. And because as soon as anything happens, it's definitely not the time to right. try to get that information out of anybody. No. And I would much rather have people, again, do that work when you're feeling well, when you're able to have those conversations, so that in those moments of darkness and difficulty, you are able to just honor your emotions and take good care of yourselves and each other and not have to stress over the business of dealing with whatever else is going on, that it's yeah. all laid out, it's ready to go. And you can save that brain energy, that emotional energy, that bodily energy to just take care of yourselves. And you really don't know the importance of that because like I say in so many of my podcasts as well, you know, if a death actually took off one of your arms and it was bleeding from your arm, you would run to the hospital and go and get help for it. Mm -hmm. But we're left with these injuries in our head and our, our emotions. And it, you don't know that that is bleeding. You don't know that that's, I'm, I'm trying to use a few metaphors here right. too because we don't know what's going on in that head. And if we don't even know ourselves, right. um, we're not given that space, like you said, to be able to deal with those emotions and feelings and stress and anger and regret and all of those things all come into play. Yeah. All and it. grief is messy. And so don't make it messier, right? Like if you can take the time now when you're healthy and well and able-bodied and able-minded to like, do what you can with your family, do it now so that in those moments it's a little less messy and a little easier to just cope and take care of yourselves. Yeah. Cause we do, do need that coping yeah. ability after we don't realize what an impact that it makes. So you're like scarred, you're wounded from each one, right? Yeah. Cause it has one more level of, uh, a cut on you. Yeah. It's what it seems like anyways. Yeah. I don't know. I'm into metaphors today. <laughs> <laughs> but um, well, thank you so very much, Amanda. That was so cool talking about grief and loss from a bit different perspective of uh, knowing there's a lot of emotions. Um, our podcast um, that we had before was do men grieve differently? So that's a very interesting topic as well, um, because do they, you know? Um, very much so. Yeah. In fact, there's a great podcast, Memories of Us, um, that actually I was just a guest on that it'll be publishing um, later in March that is all about, like Memories of Us is typically about men and grief and how they handle grief. And they actually also have support groups for men and grief. So that's a great yeah. resource. Yes, absolutely. It's on uh, my YouTube channel below. Nice. So if, if you guys, all our listeners from your backup plan tribe, if you haven't subscribed, please do. It's down below. I think right down here in this corner somewhere, the subscribe button, click on that and click on the bell. So you get notified of any of our next broadcasts. Um, I'm so happy to have had Amanda here today talking about her turmoil, her journey that she's been on. Um, I know that she's talking about it now and I'm sure it wasn't easy to talk about it before. So thank you for your bravery and your courage, Amanda. 
Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm glad I'm able to talk about it. And if I, if me speaking up and talking about it can save another family some heartache and pain and stress and drama, that's that's my hope, my goal. So, and now they've got a resource. So I'm so glad that we connected and we were able to kind of give one more reason why people should have a backup plan. Yes, thank you. Thank you so very much, Amanda. Um, um, so I hope that, you know, all our listeners can be prepared for the unexpected. And um, also during COVID time, I have learned that if you have that special person that you haven't spoken to lately, if you have that special person in your mind right now, as I'm saying this, that you haven't spoken to in the last day, please pick up that phone, send a text, send an email, tell them how much you care and love um, up to them because you never know what tomorrow will bring. So thank you so very much. Um, uh, I truly appreciate you for all of your tips and tricks, Amanda, for all our listeners today. Um, I always end with Carol Burnett um, only because she was true dearly to my heart and she could make you laugh at the worst of bad times. So I'm so glad we had this time together. Just to have a laugh or sing a song seems we just get started. And before you know it, comes the time we have to say so long. So thank you again. Thank you, listeners. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Stay safe. Wear a mask. Wash your hands. Take care. Bye for now.